The Black Company by Glenn Cook, May 1984. The pioneering novel of modern military fantasy. Welcome to Vintage Fantasy with Richard Rempel. About half a year ago, I discovered a brand new booktuber named Joseph. Joseph reads books. His project for this year intrigued me. He wanted to complete reading all Glenn Cook books. There are a lot of them. Glenn Charles Cook was born July 9th, 1944. He's still with us. He is 80 years old. Take a look, though, at this bibliography. We're going to be talking about the Black Company today. You can see May 1984. There's spin-off novels, Books of the South, and Books of the Glittering Stone. And there may be a book coming called A Pitiless Rain. There are science fiction book club hardcover omnibus editions and tour fiction softcover omnibus editions. Short stories also in this universe. Then we get to another series, Garrett P.I. This is a fantasy and mystery series with Garrett, a freelance private investigator. And as you can see here, we already have 14 novels, omnibus editions as well. Then there's The Dread Empire. This was his first series, his first book published in 1979, A Shadow of All Night Falling. Prequels and sequels, omnibus and short stories. Another series, Instrumentalities of the Night. Starfishers is a science fiction series drawing on elements of Norse mythology. Joseph has said that as good as his fantasy is, his science fiction might be even better. So I do want to find these books. Dark War, and some standalone novels, short stories, and short story collections. So you can see that Joseph is quite ambitious to try to read all of Glenn Cook's books. You can follow his journey at Joseph Reads Books. His enthusiasm for the Black Company encouraged me to buy the first book. I wanted to see what Glenn Cook was about. In this Tory Essentials edition, Stephen Erickson provides an introduction to the novel. I want to read a portion of it. My roommate dropped on me a copy of The Black Company by Glenn Cook. And here it was. The sensibility of the best of Vietnam War literature wrapped around pure otherworld fantasy. The laconic tone. The seen-it-all jadedness. The absurdity. The bitter humor. War stripped of its good guy, bad guy pretensions. The feet on the ground point of view. A grunt in Sauron's army, a nameless soldier in the ranks of those humans falling in droves to the orc horde. Who cares what side you're on? The only thing that matters is surviving. This, I'm now convinced, is where good world building begins. From the ground up, from the personal and all its immediate wants and needs and fears. Start with the mud-spattered face in the trench or the grubby back alley. Start with the sound of one person breathing, one heart beating. As Glenn Cook showed us all, you can rest an entire world on the shoulders of a handful of characters. Not in terms of prophecies, ancient heroes reborn, or any of an endless stream of devices to artificially elevate the protagonist. The real hero, after all, is kneeling in the blood-smeared mud of a battlefield. The real hero is every woman, every man is you and me. And yes we can carry an entire world. Glenn Cook walked out of the Vietnam War. Like most veterans, he's terse with details. But nobody walks away from something like that without a load of stuff on their back. Now, those loads can weigh a person down, but for the writer, any writer, more often than not, these loads are treasure. Bitter, hard-won treasure, to be sure. The kind you wouldn't wish on anybody else. But it's what you've got. Use it or it uses you. At moments, I forgot that this was a fantasy novel and could see Glenn Cook and his company in the Vietnam War. Some of the stories in this book, I'm sure, are things that happened to his company. There is a lot to explore in that conflict. As Erickson points out, this is perhaps the working out of some of that trauma. The Black Company combines elements of epic fantasy and dark fantasy. It chronicles the stories of an elite mercenary unit the Black Company, who is contracted to the Lady, ruler of the Northern Empire. In some ways, the novel reads like a fix-up novel. Each chapter is a complete story to itself. 
but maybe comparing it to a fix-up novel of short stories isn't exactly right. It's more like individual episodes of an ongoing TV series. We're introduced to members of the Black Company as they fight, retreat, advance. We get to know the people in the company, and we also get to know, piece by piece, what is going on in this kingdom. There's a lot of action, and we really get to see things from the grunt level. The fighting is almost relentless in the Black Company. We know that there's an overarching epic story, but we see things from the ground level and slowly learn about some of the things happening up here. And this is not a story of good and evil. This is more a story of the gray and black of moral ambiguity. There's a hard cynicism about the Black Company. They are caught in a world where they must be on sides, but they go to the side that pays them or rewards them. Our protagonist, also our narrator, is Croker, the company physician and historian. He keeps the annals of the Black Company. He's also fascinated by the power structure within this kingdom and the enchantress, the lady. This infatuation brings him into contact with her eventually. New to the company is a tough hombre named Raven. He becomes a fascinating character through this book. In one of the first stories, he rescues a young girl named Darling. She becomes his ward. Will she humanize the dark Raven or become his Achilles heel? The stories introduce us to a level of wizards just below the Enchantress. There are ten, and they're called the Taken. Each of them has unique and awful powers. All the stories barrel towards a conclusion where we have a giant battle. Late in the novel, Croker is coming to realize that the lady is evil, but that the dominator, who was once her husband, may be more evil. The forces that they are facing, the rebels, the white rose, may actually be forces of the dominator. Reading from page 242. Cunning woman. She did not assume the role of maiden in distress. She played it as one equal to another, and that won my sympathy more surely. She knew I knew the dominator, as well as did any mundane now alive. Knew I must fear him far more than her, for who fears a woman more than a man? I know you, analyst. I have opened your soul and peered inside. You fight for me because your company has undertaken a commission it will pursue to the bitter end because its principal personalities feel its honor was stained in barrel, and that though most of you think you're serving evil, evil is relative, analyst. You can't hang a sign on it. You can't touch it or taste it or cut it with a sword. Evil depends on where you are standing, pointing your indicting finger. Where you stand now, because of your oath, is opposite the dominator. For you, he is where your evil lies. She paced a moment perhaps anticipating a response. I made none. She had encapsulated my own philosophy. I think this excerpt also gives you a good feel for the writing of Cook. Terse yet competent prose. Cook refuses and confounds us at turns when we think that something is going to go the way that we're familiar with in fantasy. This is what makes this novel very interesting. Yet with all this gray and black, there are moments of light. Moments of making decisions based on conscience. This is a novel of skirmishes which eventually culminate in one large battle at the end. It does conclude, but it also gives you hints of what is to come. If you're willing to go into that heart of darkness with a company just trying to survive, if you're willing to wade into the moral swamp of war and fantasy with small moments of sacrifice and conscience-based decisions, if you're willing to go on a roller coaster ride with some big set pieces, this novel is for you. I give it 8.5 out of 10. I don't plan to return to the Black Company very soon, but I do want to explore Cook's science fiction. I'd love to hear your thoughts below in the comments. Until next time, keep reading.